Uh, good afternoon, teachers and learning leaders of the School District of Philadelphia. My name is Elizabeth Williams Wesley, and I'm the Director of Equity and Inclusion at Central High School. Thank you for joining us for this very special panel discussion on culturally responsive education on this day that happens to be the 91st birthday of our powerful and radical ancestor, Toni Morrison, who we shall never forget. The purpose of this event is to learn from national experts what culturally responsive education is and the actions that we need to take in order to shift our curriculum and pedagogical practices to execute culturally responsive strategies that build trusting relationships, emphasize joy with respect to students' identities and the social political issues in the world today. In this way, curriculum and instruction will be more rigorous and relevant, cultivating student uh, students' genius. <clears throat> As a reminder, the panel discussion will be held from 1.30 to 2.30, followed by a 30-minute Q&A session. Please know that this session is being recorded. Please utilize the Q&A function of Zoom during a discussion, and we will respond to questions at 2.30 during our Q&A session of this afternoon's event. There will be two Google Forms for the audience. One is being dropped in the chat now as a sign-in. The second form will be completed at the session's end. So be sure to stay with us until the end to complete it for Act 48 credits. Let me take a moment to drop this in the chat. Please take a moment to sign in. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and uplift the work of the Office of Academic Supports, the Board of Education and the Office of Director, Equity and Inclusion at the School District of Philadelphia. Today's panel supports the Culturally and Linguistic Inclusive Foundation, also known as CLIF, created by the Office of Academic Support. The OAS is intentional and committed in the focus of, or the focus on dismantling racist systems and providing equitable learning experiences. To this end, the CLIF was generated for purposeful urgency around promoting equitable, inclusive practices that help all students thrive. Thank you, Dr. Brooks and the social studies team. Next, I'd like to acknowledge and uplift the work of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the School District of Philadelphia, which has provided an equity framework. The equity framework is a comprehensive tool that will be used to support clear system-wide race and equity actions with measurable results. This panel supports the commitments put forth by the Office of DEI. Thank you, Dr. Jubilee and team. Last but not least, this panel supports the vision and mission of our Board of Education and especially Guardrail 4, which aims to dismantle racist practices and a systemic racism that hinders students' achievements. Thank you to our Board of Education. In addition to acknowledging the work that has been done, I'd like to acknowledge the land that we're on. With gratitude and humility, we recognize Philadelphia as a part of the Lenape Hokin, the ancestral homelands of the Lenape people, whose presence and resilience in Pennsylvania continues to this day. A long history of the broken treaties, forced migrations, and fraud fraudulent agreements displaced many of the Lenape from this land. We take this opportunity to honor the original owners and caretakers of this land and recognize the histories of land threat land theft, violence, erasure, and oppression that, have brought, that has brought our institution and ourselves here. We strive, we strive to act as allies to Lenape people in their vibrant communities today, including the federally recognized nations Delaware Tribe, Delaware Nation, and the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to Lenape ancestors, past and present, by committing to build a more inclusive and equitable space for all. At this time, I would like to introduce our panelists. It is my honor to bring these four phenomenal national experts on culturally responsive education to the School District of Philadelphia. It brings me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kamika Royal. Dr. Royal is a native Philadelphian, alumni of Central High School, associate professor of urban education at Loyola University and urban education expert. Dr. Royal's work focuses on the intersections of racism, history, politics, and urban school reform. Dr. Royal's debut book, Not Paved for Us, Black Educators and Public School Reform in Philadelphia, is available for pre-order right now and will be released in May from Harvard, Harvard Education Press. Thank you again, Dr. Royal, for being with us. Next, I am so excited to introduce you all to Dr. Shannon Waite. 
Dr. Waite is a powerhouse in educational leadership. Dr. Waite joined Howard University in the fall of 2021 as a visiting assistant professor at Howard University's Educational Leadership and Policy Studies Division. Formerly a clinical assistant professor of educational leadership in the Graduate School of Education at Fordham University, Dr. Waite also worked in various positions in the New York City Department of Education. Her research expertise includes topics on diversity recruitment and pipeline programs culturally responsive school leadership, developing critical consciousness in educational leaderships and examining hyper segregation and its connection to the school to prison pipeline. Thank you again, Dr. Waite for joining us today. Our next panelist inspires my own day-to-day -day classroom practices. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Stacy Patton. Dr. Patton is an assistant professor teaching digital storytelling and media literacy courses in the Department of Media, Journalism, and Film at Howard University. Dr. Patton's passion, her expertise, and her research is focused on issues of child welfare, race relations, and higher education. She is the author of That Mean Old Yesterday, a memoir, Spare the Kids While Whooping Children Won't Save Black America, and the forthcoming book, Strung Up, The Lynching of Black Children and Teenagers in America, 1880 to 1968. Dr. Patton is a nationally recognized child advocate. She has won numerous journal journalism awards. Her work has appeared in various publications and she has made appearance on multiple news media outlets. Dr. P, as she is affectionately known by her students, is a self-proclaimed amygdala whisperer. And she's here to share her expertise and best practice in social emotional learning, trauma-informed pedagogy, and knowledge in how neurology informs culturally responsive education. Thank you, Dr. Patton, for joining us today. And finally, last but far from least, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Godi Muhammad to the School District of Philadelphia. Dr. Muhammad is currently an Associate Professor of Literacy, Language, and Culture at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where she also serves as the Director of Urban Literacy Collaborative and Clinic. Collaborative and Clinic. Her research interests are situated in the historical foundations of literacy development and the writing practices among Black communities. She strives to shape the national conversation for educating youth who have been underserved. She works with teachers and young people across the United States and South Africa in best practices and culturally responsive instruction. She also served as a school board president and continues to work collaboratively with local schools across communities in the Atlanta area. Dr. Muhammad has won numerous awards. More recently, she, she was awarded the 2018 University of Illinois Chicago Researcher of the Year and was awarded $750,000 by the U.S. Department of Education to study culturally and historically responsive literacy in STEM classrooms. Her book entitled Cultivating Genius, an Equity Framework for Culturally and Historically Responsive Literacy was released in 2020. Dr. Muhammad has a prior engagement, but will be joining us shortly I'm here. <gasps> Hello, Dr. Muhammad. Welcome. I'm so happy you're here. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. So let's get started. Let's get started with the first question for the panel. And the first question is to tell us about how your academic work and experience in educational spaces builds upon and develops the pedagogy of culturally responsive education. And then based on this, how would you define culturally responsive education? Someone, anyone take it away. I'll start. Um, so this was a multi, a multi-tier question. So <laughs> let's split it up yeah. so I can keep up with you. How my journey did what now? Tell us about how your academic work and experience in education spaces builds upon and develops the pedagogy of culturally responsive education. Yep. Okay. So um, when I was, so I've been a teacher. I became a teacher in 1999. Um, and I was a master student at Johns Hopkins at the time, and we had to read um, Dream Keepers by Gloria Ladson Billings. And I didn't know her then. I didn't. I didn't know anything about her. Um, 
but her book really informed how I approached teaching middle school back then, which has really sort of um, informed the rest of my career. My second year of teaching, I think that was the first time I surveyed my students about what they wanted to learn, um, what topics they were specifically interested in. And so we're talking about back in 2001, um, we were dealing with um, Amadou Diallo, uh, wasn't too far in the past at that time. Um, Abner Louima had been um, terrorized by the police in New York. And so teaching in Baltimore, I, and I was teaching in a, in a mixed race school that was about 60% black and 40% um, white. And so black children, most of my black students were concerned about police violence against unarmed citizens. Um, many of my white students were less concerned about violence, but more concerned about police abuses of power. And they would ask things like, well, how come when the light is red, they turn on the, the siren and they cross so they can go through the red light? Like, I don't think that's right because regular cars can't do that. And if my parents were to go through the red light, they would get in trouble. Um, and so one of the things I took away from Gloria Ladson Billings framework of culturally relevant pedagogy back then was this insistence on socio-political consciousness. Um, so whenever I'm teaching about or even thinking about my own work around cultural relevance, I'm thinking about her three tenets, which are academic excellence, um, cultural competence, and sociopolitical awareness. Um, it fuels my current work. So currently, uh, as I teach um, aspiring teachers and in-service teachers who hope to either get certified or become uh, administrators, the thing that... Um, so, you know, most schools started focusing so heavily on academic excellence and they have these trite ideas of culture that have been reduced to things like, well, let me have some rap lyrics, right? Um, and then there's very rarely people talking about socio-political consciousness. And so that's what I would say informs most of my work now, trying to um, encourage, build in, remind um, the teachers who I am preparing about the importance of paying attention, not just to your, your, your individual life, but the world around you, um, that your work be bigger than you and your community, that it be suited, it be suitable for, um, for what goes beyond where we are, but also goes into the future. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. I'll let my other panelists pick up there. So I'll go. Um, so I'm a journalist who writes mostly about race, culture, education, child welfare issues. And as a historian, my academic work focuses on the intersections of race and parenting uh, in American life. My last book examined how the toxic stress of physical punishment, which is not native to Black culture, but is a byproduct of colonialism and slavery, undermines children's academic performance and places them at risk for brain alterations, emotional regulation issues, aggressive behavior, and places them at risk for the school to prison pipeline. And so you have parents who use hitting as a strategy to teach good behavior and to improve learning outcomes, but they're actually undermining their own agenda, especially as traumatized, dysregulated, hypervigilant, danger mapping children of color enter into classrooms where they're mostly being taught by white teachers um, who make up, uh, who dominate the profession, um, carrying their own biases, cultural gaps, fears about young people of color, and who are not trauma informed. Now, as a scholar activist, I've been involved with a growing movement to ban corporal punishment in public schools. It may be surprising to people to know that in 19 states, paddling students with wooden boards is still legal in public schools. Uh, those who are disproportionately targeted for this kind of punishment are black and brown students and students with disabilities. Uh, the practice is still legal in charter and public schools in every state with the exception of New Jersey and Iowa. Um, and then I'm completing this book on the lynching of black children during Jim Crow. But the book um, also explores the historical roots of the racialization of childhood in American life and connects this history to current debates over the so-called adultification of black children by law enforcement, juvenile justice professionals, 
and teachers, but I'm arguing that the adultification bias theory is wrong. Um, black children are not targeted because they're mistakenly seen as adults or intentionally expedited into perceived maturity, but they are targeted precisely because they're black and because they're young. Black children have long been considered the children of a race of people who are stuck in a continuous limbo of childhood and considered intellectually inferior, criminally deviant, and undeserving of the privileges, rights, and protections reserved for adulthood and for full citizenship. So there's no point in adultifying Black children when the infantilization of Black people sets them up for all kinds of discrimination and violence in classrooms and in the streets. So whether Black children are considered children or adults is irrelevant to white supremacy. So it's this history which informs my research, my activism, efforts to decolonize Black parenting, and informs my own pedagogical practices in the college classroom, which are built around culturally responsive education. Culturally responsive education to me means um, that this is not about engaging in, in token acts of diversity and inclusion. It means learning about intersectional identities and histories of my individual students. Um, it also means that I have to be versed in the history of childhood, versed in the history of racism and childism, um, historical and intergenerational trauma, and how modern educational practices and policies have long moved through the language of race and racism. And so for me to be a culturally responsive educator means that my curriculum has to respond to my students' unique needs, their cultures, and their life experiences. All this is absolutely foundational to learning. And it means that I must teach subjects within a culturally familiar context that allows them to make connections between their new knowledge and their own real lived experiences. And I gotta intentionally create an atmosphere which is designed for them to thrive, designed for them to feel empowered intellectually, emotionally, socially, and politically. So I create a tribal classroom where we belong to each other. Uh, part of creating the tribe is to explore and em em embrace the backgrounds of all the members and include them as part of the definition of the tribe that we're building you know, uh, together. And lastly, since I teach at an HBCU, this also means that I have to do some corrective healing restorative work to fix the damage done by the K-12 system and other adverse childhood experiences that they're bringing, sometimes bringing into the classroom. Um, so in the classroom, I empower my students by healing, rebuilding them, helping them find their voice, urging them to take up space, nurturing a healthy sense of entitlement and belonging. And, and then I'll just close by saying this, that I think that culturally responsive education means that we must recognize that the young people we educate are a diverse collection of living, breathing human beings with complex evolutionary histories, cultural backgrounds, and life stories. And so likewise, as educators, we have our own hidden histories in our bodies, cultural scripts, um, emotional memories, and socialization, socialization that guides us on a sometimes unconscious level, which shows up in our teaching practices. So our job um, is to not just impart information, but to engage and attach to our students, um, to our, our, our tribe, and to bring our humanity to work and form um, secure attachments with our students. Thank you. Oh, so I can pick up there. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for you know, organizing such a beautiful panel around such meaningful topics and work. Um, you know, I, I love all my sisters on the panel. I love this work that we do. Sometimes it's heavy. Uh, sometimes it's met, met with threats of violence and resistance. But, you know, I'm just so, I'm glad that we are in community with each other. You know, um, I, I want to build upon what's been said about CRE. You know, when we, when we think of the the queen, Dr. Gloria Lassing Billings, right? We, we think of her work being situated in the pillars of you know, academic success and cultural competence and social political consciousness. And that's how I've always sort of gone in defining CRE. If I see those three things, 
I see CRE. If it, I don't see all three, I don't see CRE. You know, and I say that because a lot of people think that CRE, and if you go a little deeper, it's not just seeing it, but assessing it and um, having learning objectives and standards around it. A lot of folks think that, oh, if I'm doing CRE just by showing a text that has a character with my children in it. If I'm including multicultural text, but uh, I'm doing CRE, and in my perspective, you're not. You're just doing academic success with a culture with a multicultural book. You know, if you don't have learning objectives set around cultural competence, social political consciousness, and assessments and teacher evaluations, right? If you don't have all those things in the policies and in the curriculum instruction, you don't fully have it. So, in my work, I have been taking more of a historical look back. You know, so even though this was coined, you know, in the 90s, before that, in the early 1900s, you know, I, I studied the, the abolitionist work and the culturally responsive work of, you know, folks like Carter G. Woodson and W.B. Du Bois, and before that, in the 1800s, like Maria Stewart um, and others, and Anna Julia Cooper. But my work looks at a part of uh, Black history, American history, that they never taught me within black literary societies. I studied these spaces that started in 1828 in cities like Philadelphia. I look at how they organized in Philadelphia and how they came together to uh, cultivate genius and joy to fight against racism and liberation and, and for equity and all these things. And I studied, well, what were they doing in Philadelphia and other cities? What did they read? What were their goals for learning? What were their assessment practices like? And I use blackness as a model of how we should be educating every child. You know, surprisingly, we don't see a lot of models in uh, black and brown districts that were written by black and brown people. And so I found that they defined, they were doing culturally responsive practices. And so I call it culturally and historically to honor the ancestral genius of, of who they were and what they did. And so I, I've sort of been moving my work and defining CRE into five major pursuits. And pursuits was actually a word used by the ancestors. They did not call their learning standards standards. <laughs> they called them pursuits because they embodied something greater than passing the test or graduating. And they, they said, uh, we must be in the practice of identity development of self and others of skill development across the different content areas. The third was intellectualism. The fourth was criticality, working to help our young people name, understand, and disrupt oppression, such as racism. And five was joy, helping our children to see the beauty in the world. Now, what we're doing in schools today is just academic success, just skills and intellect. And maybe we're doing intellect, maybe we're not. And they carry so much greater of uh, excellence and rigor, right? And so that's the work that I've been doing moving forward. How do we take these five pursuits and, and look at it in terms of policy, practice, curriculum assessment? And when, you know, I've been using, doing these five pursuits for 13 years now, <laughs> and even with research studies, we have seen a different teacher and a different child, and it has been more excellent. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Dr. Well, Wait. Well, I don't know that I need to go now because I feel like my sister's done said everything. Um, with regard to my work, so um, doctors Royal Muhammad work uh, in the classroom with, well, they work with people who are in the classroom, preparing them. And um, Dr. Patton works with undergraduates, repairing them, right, from the trauma of pre-K through 12 education. And when students come to me at the graduate level, they are either in pursuit of a administration, a position in administration, or they are current administrators. And the work that I do with them focuses heavily on helping them understand that in order to execute academic excellence, they have to first begin by interrogating their intrapersonal racism, biases, um, 
And they have to do that in order to be effective administrators and help teachers properly support students to be able to get to that AYP student achievement, et cetera, that you know, districts place such a heavy emphasis on. And the only way they can do that is really by, be, by first examining and reflecting upon their ontological perspectives in life, right? And understand that their epistemological your personal epistemologies directly impact and influence your professional practice. So if you grew up in homes where it was cool to make jokes about darkies, or you grew up in homes that ran Archie Bunker, right? You grew up in homes that made, um, that use racial epithets to refer to Latinx folks, Italians, Irish folk, Jewish folk. Um, you grew up in homes where it was cool to talk about lynchings as a joke and jest, then for you to think that none of that has made an impression upon how you see the black and brown students sitting in your classrooms is disingenuous at best. And so um, I focus on culturally responsive school leaders and my work is, I think everybody who studies criticality has been connected to the queen, right? Like, I don't know how you would do that work if you, if you aren't talking about Lassen Billings and Tate, if you're not talking about Bell, if you're not talking about Crenshaw, like if you're not, you know, reading that work, um, Hooks, if you're not making any of those references, then I'm not sure that you're actually doing criticality or culturally responsive education, because I'm not sure how responsive or cultural um, your study of the, of the literature is. And my biggest point that I will leave you with, because I'm monitoring the time, it, well, I don't know if it's the biggest point. It's one that I hope folks receive in the spirit in which it is being said, which is to be helpful, because that's why we're here, right? For individuals who really struggle with the idea, um, because I went on your website, uh, the Philadelphia School District, and you guys have a great website. Um, and I took a look at a couple of things in particular and specific to the office um, that is hosting this, you all have made some very bold commitments and I applaud that. I applaud that. Um, I just really want to see though, right? I, I would love to see your budget, right? Because what we do know is we fund what we care about. So this panel is great. All these sisters is dope. I'm taking notes, right? Um, in order though, to make, to make sure that you back up these commitments that we've made, and that there's like a good five to seven of them. And they, I mean, Goldie, they've got disrupting. Can we get in there talking about they dismantling, what they gonna do? And I just wanna see how you are gonna do it. Um, and I wanna see what that's gonna look like in schools. And if you are not actively working with the people who are leading schools, the people who are leading school, who are working with the people leading schools, the people working with the people who lead, who work with people who lead schools, and you are not interrogating your own interpersonal um, biases, impact of white supremacy, then it's problematic. Uh, I think Dr. Patton said it best when she talked about how she has a lot of repairing to do. The biggest shock that some of my students who look like me find is that they too can be uh, influenced and impacted by, yeah, you know where I'm going already, um, having drank so much of the Kool-Aid that is sold through pre-K pre through 12 education. And it smacks them in the face when they come to me and they realize that they can get some of this smoke too because they are also upholding uh, su white supremacist tenants and they're weaponizing those tenants against children of color and they're harming children, not supporting them. So that's my contribution. I want to say something before Liz asks the next question. Um, Dr. Pat, and I want to thank you for the repair you're doing with HBCU students. Because um, I was an HBCU student at North Carolina Central University coming out of Central High School that's hosting this. Um, and there was definitely some repair that was needed and repair I got. And folks at HBCUs loved me so much um, that they showed up in Philadelphia 15 years after I graduated undergrad to see me defend my dissertation. 
And so I don't know that many people, if, they're, if they haven't been through an HBCU experience, if they will ever know the impact HBCU professors make on their students um, to not only teach them, but to rebuild them. So I just wanted to give you a shout out for that. I also wanted to tell people that Gloria Ladson Billings, who we've been talking about, is a product of the School District of Philadelphia. She is a January 1965 graduate of Overbrook High School. She is my favorite scholar out of West Philly, and she uh, wrote the foreword for my book. That's it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for all your, your wisdom and your words. Uh, and I do wanna go on to the next question. And so the next question is, how would you like to see CRE, particularly the approaches that you've described, uh, implemented in classrooms across the city of Philadelphia. So I'll jump I, in. I, oh, go ahead, sis. Okay, um, I'll jump in first to say that I think the the first step is for all educators to be trained in trauma informed pedagogy. Um, and so I do a lot of this training with K-12 teachers and even college professors. And so I teach how to practice brain-based uh, education. So we explore things like evolution, attachment theory, social and developmental psychology, uh, social neuroscience, and how we implement all of that in our day-to-day -day pedagogical practices. Um, so for example, when my students enter the classroom on day one, I see their faces. Yes, I recognize their diversity, but I also literally try to picture their brains, their HPA axis system, their vagus nerves, neural pathways, the you know hormones co coursing through their uh, bloodstream. And I'm keenly aware that their interactions with me, uh, the tone that I said, and the classroom climate that we create together um, can impact their bodies and their learning outcomes in either positive or negative ways. Um, so students' uh, ability to learn is regulated by how they're treated in the world, at home, in the streets, in the classroom. And so they read and react to other people's behaviors, emotions, and attitudes and yours um, into your body and how you take up space in the classroom as an educator. Um, this is, is, is all hardwired into all of our brains. We're all wired to connect, to attune, to uh, resonate with and learn from others. So if students don't feel safe to learn from you, then their brains are gonna shut down. They won't have access to all the thinking parts of their brain. So your brains are linked together with your students. And you have as, as teachers, this awesome power to impact and heal the brains of others. And so I think, educators in Philly and across the country need to understand that successful teaching um, is a neurobiological process where you can uh, help optimize the, the plasticity of your students' brains and build new neural structures, including with students who have histories of trauma. And so all the research shows that brains grow best and they learn best in the context of supporting relationships and in classroom environments where there are low levels of stress. Um, secure relationships with your students um, not only trigger brain growth, but also serve emotional regulation that enhances their learning. So we have to remove fear from the classroom. I see so much fear in my classroom. Some of it's carried over through the K-12 process. Some have grown up in houses where parents told them they were to be seen and not heard, to speak uh, when spoken to, answer when called. Um, they, they've been, their imaginations have been dulled by the lack of fostering critical thinking. They don't know how to begin stories because they've been given test prompts. Um, they just, they've had to, you know, they've been uh, taught to survive and to obey. And none of this makes for, for my field good journalism and storytelling. And so far too many students I know in Philadelphia and other urban areas are, are growing up in stressful family sit settings and neighborhoods. Schools are yet another zone of intimidation and violence. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's emotional. And many students are in learning environments where teachers use a fear as a pedagogical strategy, fear of failure, fear of an unwanted call home, fear of the teacher, fear of ridicule, fear of some unpleasant consequence. And they believe that fear is a prime motivator for students to do high quality work. 
Um, so this intentional creation of fear in the classroom, um, unfortunately, is just widely used. So we've got to get rid of it because it compromises the ability to learn. When we feel threatened and when we experience fear, we shift, we downshift to survival mode. So physiologically speaking, students in an environment characterized by fear are not able to think effectively and to learn as much as those who are environments that make them feel uh, safe and secure. And I'll say this one last thing. Now, I'm not asking people here to become social workers, counselors, therapists, uh, psychiatrists, neuroscientists. You got into this profession like I did because you wanna teach. But being a teacher not only means being knowledgeable about the content of your discipline, but also knowledgeable about your students' lives and about the things that have been impacting the development of their brains. And what we as educators can do for students, particularly those with histories of trauma, is to provide them with a corrective relational experience. So I do things like mindfulness in the classroom, guided meditation, I feed my students, I bring weighted blankets, stress balls, Play-Doh, coloring books, um, essential oils in the classroom, background music to calm the limbic system, do breathing, exercising, knitting, you know, all of these things to make students feel safe in the classroom before we can even get into the cultural, uh, uh, the complexities of the cultural stuff that we're, tr we're trying to teach. So, you know, when it comes, and I'll try to be quick and plain, and because I know this is a really important question, you know, we have to move out of uh, theoretical spaces. You know, as someone who's been in academia, I am unraveling from it. I got tired of saying words that my people and communities didn't know what that looks like in a lesson plan and practice. So we have to move to like some very plain practices, like this is what's needed. And, and that's, that's what I write about. And that's what I want to talk about. I think first we have to, in addition to all that checking in your heart, anti-trauma work and what my bestie calls archeological digs of self, you know, Yolanda Seeley Ruiz, we have to do the self work before we approach anything related to skills, identity, criticality, intellectualism, and joy. But we gotta start thinking about who are we hiring and electing? To be a board member, you gotta teach. <laughs> I'm sorry, like I work with people, I write board policies for them. I need to see that you have some more emphasis in education. Even if you go in and do a guest lecture, some kind of something, right? I need you to know that you can teach, you can write curriculum, you have done your work. The interview questions we ask don't even move toward a lot of black historical excellence. You're getting ready to, um, to work in Philly. How would I see black historical excellence in your math? See, we got to start inviting different type of people to be on our platform, to be in our communities. And now I, I just want to say, if we do five things, this will dramatically change the practical part. Number one, we need a new set of learning standards. If I can rewrite the common core by myself, imagine what I can do with a group of people. <laughs> imagine what we can do together. Why do we still only use common core when they ha we have found that it hasn't been common to black children? That's unethical. Number two, we need to stop paying millions and hundreds and thousands of dollars for a non-culturally responsive curriculum with some multicultural text added to it. We, we don't stand up to textbook companies and publishing companies and say, ah, uh -uh, we need a Philly curriculum. How do you not have black literary societies which started in Philly in the social studies curriculum? That's absurd to me. Number three, we need to assess what we value. If we value cultural competence and we need it in the state assessments, we need it in the, the district and school-wide assessments and day-to-day -day assessments. We have, I've been starting to assess joy in schools across California and, and the, the data is beautiful. I've been assessing criticality and all these things. We talk about equity data, but equity data is not comparing black children with others. Equity data is when we're collecting data on identity, criticality, and joy, in addition to the academics. Number four, <laughs> I don't know if I'm on four or five, four, teacher evaluations. New York, Chicago uses the Danielson, Charlotte Danielson, who has told us out loud that she has never designed this to be a tool for equity, culturally responsive, 
why are some of our most diverse, I'm talking about 85 to 89% black and brown children in these districts. And you are choosing a white framework to evaluate your teachers. That's just not gonna work for us. And so what we gotta do, I can, I can write a teacher evaluation. All of this is not hard, but we have to actually adopt it and mandate it. All we do is talk about CRE and it's not in our policy, it's not in our mandates. And number five is our teacher education programs. We have to go to them as a district and say, we will no longer hire your teacher candidates unless you give them classes and preparation in trauma, archeological digs of self, <laughs> CRE, Philly's history. I mean, you all set the rubric, you all set it. And that's, and then you're pushing universities to rechange, to change their programs because you, you're messing with their pockets, right? They lose money. And so if, we, if they don't have uh, graduates who have jobs, right? And I know there's a shortage in this and that, but this is why Uncle Jimmy said we have to go for broke. If we can redo those things and use our funds and our, our influence to change those five things, we will have a dramatically different system with CRE. Um, so I 100% agree. So let me speak to Philly context a little bit. Um, so the board is not elected, the board is appointed. So when we talk about having a criteria for people, most of the folks who are creating the list um, of who gets appointed um, and who the mayor are appointing people from, I'm trying to say this in the most diplomatic way possible because it doesn't necessarily apply just because somebody inevitably is going to send me an email, an angry email telling me, you know, not me and how dare you say X, Y, Z, right? Um, but not only are they not educators, but they don't, the things you're talking about, we would have to, as a school district in Philadelphia, stop operating as if we are desperate stepchildren waiting for someone to hand us um, whatever scraps they can come up with. When I hear you talk about um, the teacher prep programs, we won't take your teachers unless you, know, you do this, that, and the other. I would like to see the data on how many teachers are coming from teacher prep programs and how many teachers are coming from alternative certification programs, right? And what it would mean to actually press on them, right? To, to have something that would be what you're describing, but I worry that those folks aren't aligned with the interests of black children either. As much as they like to say they are and they have their equity initiatives that really won't disrupt anything or bust a grape in a fruit bite. Um, there's a lot going on in Philadelphia where I feel like people keep selling our children out um, for our own individual position and gain. So when we're talking about what would I like to see, I would like to see um, some more, um, how do I, uh, I don't know that it's professional development, you know, something though for our educators, because Everybody talking about social justice ain't talking about the same thing. Everybody claiming to be in schools and classrooms for righteous reasons um, aren't talking about, they're not talking about the same thing. Everybody claims um, they're here, here for the children, but, but they're fully prepared to sell the children out to the highest bidder, bidder or the check coming in. Um, and so I fully stand by everything Dr. Muhammad suggested, but there's there's some the problem is coming from inside the house, um, unfortunately, from inside the house and outside the house. I'm looking at you, um, state legislature across the state of Pennsylvania. So um, it's just multi-layered. Um, and there's a lot that has to be disentangled to begin that work. So I'll come in. I'm happy to. Thank you, Dr. Royale. As a formerly appointed mayoral appointee to the panel for educational policy in New York City, which is also an appointed school board. Everything she said is absolutely correct. And um, Dr. Muhammad, no, ain't nobody taught. Ain't nobody taught. Ain't nobody was a school aide. Um, some folks might, might have been on the PTA. They might have been a part of the um, community education councils. 
might, but the criteria is that you know someone who um, recommends you for appointment. <laughs> That's literally the criteria. That's how I got appointed. Now, what I will say is the person who appointed me, and I won't say their name because they're off living their very best life. Uh, the person who nominated me for appointment is off living her very best life and continue to live your very best life, sis. I, pro I, I, I would imagine that her road got a lot rockier when I came on the panel in 2018 because unlike any of my other colleagues, you could not pee on my leg and tell me it was raining. You could not bring people in front of me and talk about how much time it took to do X, Y, and Z and why this wasn't possible because I was in the classroom. I recruited teachers to teach in New York City. I was a human resource director, which is where I really learned how the um, sausage gets made. And so you couldn't tell me what the contract said because I had read the contract because I had to advocate on behalf of my principals for with the contract. And so I, I will say that it is going what it's going to take, if I may, humbly, it's going to take more grassroots efforts and it's going to take more people actually giving teeth to the people who live in the community. It cannot continue and consistently be, and now I'm just making, um, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, um, Dr. Royale, because um, now I'm talking about New York. It cannot just be people consistently coming from outside of the community, um, telling people who live in the community what they need. Okay, it can't be. And that has to be interrupted. And in addition to that, if you are a transplant from outside of the community, I am not a native New York City person. I grew up in New York, which to the rest of them city people down there, you know, anything above the five boroughs is upstate New York. But the rest of us New Yorkers know that's not true. Okay, um, upstate, you know, we know upstate. But I taught in New York City. I made my, I started my life in New York City. Um, got married and divorced in New York City, had my children in New York City, all of those things. And I can tell you that when I was appointed to that board and I started to see what was really going on and the most disheartening thing, someone asked me this, I talked at uh, Chancellor, former Chancellor, uh, Dr. Porter's class last night. Someone asked me, what was your biggest reflection from your time on the panel? And I said, when I realized that the system was constructed to fail children. And that even when I was in this position of power, there was very little I could actually do outside of resist, right? To change that. And so that takes me to, Goldie, you said, why do we use the, the common core when we've seen that it's not responsive to black children? Because it's intentional because this country is anti-Black and education specifically, because we have been conditioned to believe in a, meritocracy, a, system, a system of meritocracy that does not exist because it continues to be perpetuated in academe and in pre-K through 12 education. And then students are conditioned to believe that if you don't meet these whitewashed dominant you know, standards, that you somehow are less than. And that's the work that Dr. Patton's talking about, she got to correct. That's the work that Dr. Royale is talking about. Her alma mater repaired her from coming. And as someone, and now I'm getting a little too passionate, so I hope when the clip goes out, I'm not the angry black woman on it. But if I am, y'all who were here, you really know what the deal is. The, the reality of the situation is as someone who's gone through predominantly white institutions my entire life was tokenized that one that I worked at okay, in academe before I had the benefit of coming, right? This is harmful. And for those of you who don't understand, because to Dr. Patton's point, education is predominantly female and it is predominantly white. I just want to be clear, when we talk about white supremacy, ain't nobody talking about white people, right? We're talking about systems and structures. And then sometimes we are talking about individuals, but to be clear, largely when we're talking about racism, racism is not these individual acts. It's not this one bad person, right? It's a collection of people, right? That support and sustain systems to oppress 
historically excluded, not marginalized, y'all pushed us to the margins. You excluded us and continue to attempt to erase us. That's why Dr. Muhammad is out here gotta remind you about black literacy groups. I happened to hear Dr. Uh, uh, Jeff Duncan Adrande um, at a, a, a conference several years ago. And I'm telling you, that was part like healing, hearing him, that was so healing from my soul. You know what he said, y'all? He was like, what do you mean grit? This is at the relay um, uh, conference, and mainly <laughs> the president or CEO of relay at that time, because you know, they do that in co combination with Angela Duckworth, right? And so she was in the front row and he was like, what do you mean grit? You're telling me that my kids in, in, in uh, LA, they don't have grit when they walk across gang in fact, like what, what, what are you talking about grit? How, what do you mean black kids can't do science? Do you understand that chemistry comes from commit? Do you understand that the first university was in Timbuktu? He was like, what you mean Latinx kids can't do math? Do you understand that Mayans invented the concept of settle? But no, we don't understand that because this country is anti-Black, has excluded us from history. That is why, and to, uh, you asked a question on the list that you sent us about what this backlash is. I know that we're talking about CRE, but to CRT, so I got to go here. The backlash is specifically that. Because we have been awakened, awoken, whatever you want to say, we know who we are, and we are every single one of our ancestors and are determined to interrupt the pathologies of white supremacy and racism that have oppressed generations before us, and we have said no more, no generations after us will come. That's why you see this legislation. So it is not that people take issue with white people. It is not that there is some sort of, um, we're trying to, uh, do Olympic, uh, what, uh, oppression Olympics and, and be more superior. That is not what this is. It's simply, we want our damn humanity and we're gonna take it. We're not asking for it no more, okay? And, and I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, Dr. Wade. I want to, uh, I, gotta, I gotta bring in an elephant in the room now. I'm gonna move one question that was lower. Up because you already brought it up. So how do you define critical race theory and what is the connection of critical race theory to CRE, culturally responsive education? And then if you wanna share your thoughts about the current legislation against it, you can do that as well. So I'm here like, let me in coach. Um, so the vast majority of people who are railing against critical race theory don't even know what it is. It's a framework that was developed by legal scholars such as the great Rest His Soul, Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, and others. They use this framework in law schools to show how most institutions in American society and the law itself, right, the law itself have been shaped by systemic racism. Critical race theory has also been used uh, in anti-racism training in government agencies and private businesses, but there is no school system in the country which uses it as a basis for curricular development. Now, excuse my cynicism for a second here, but the schools which actually use critical race theory tend to be elite private schools who train white elites of the future to passionately apologize for racism while doing absolutely nothing about dismantling structural inequality and decolonizing things like education. Uh, racial equity and justice are not the end goals. Um, and so ever since the murder of um, George Floyd, public schools have been under you know, increased pressure to present uh, more materials that are dealing with racism in the past and in the present. Um, so it is, it, is, it is this development, which is actually culturally responsive teaching, which has been now given the label of critical race theory and has now come under attack. And so now we're seeing all this manipulation, book banning, intimidation of teachers, dangerous legislations, fines, fear of historical research, shrill cries of don't make white students feel uncomfortable. We must protect our children from these evil left-wing radical theorists. 
And the same parents who are now trying to get books banned and burning books, they're actually the descendants of those who bought their own children to traumatizing lynchings so they would be inducted into the fraternity of whiteness and to ensure that their commitment to preserving white supremacy would be consecrated in blood and affirmed through acts of violence. And so these, these polarizing debates over critical race theory in schools is, is characterized by bad faith on both sides, on all sides. You know, despite all this hand wringing over the alleged harm that critical race theory can do to students, conservatives and liberals do not care about the mental well being of white children. White supremacy does not respect anybody's children, including white children. And conservatives, they have a long history of abuses and neglects of children in schools, in public education, championing corporal punishment. All the legislation we've been trying to get pushed to ban corporal punishment in public schools, it's been the conservatives who pushed back against it. Look at how they've been fighting gun control in the face of school shootings. I thought that when Sandy Hook happened, like, oh, this is gonna be the moment when we finally get, he, he killed little white babies. So we're finally gonna get gun control. And when that didn't happen, it was co confirmation um, to me that they don't care. And neither liberals or uh, Democrats, uh, liberals or conservatives are invested in dismantling structural racism that has intellectually disabled and psychologically damaged generations of black children. So all this backlash um, is, is, is um, linked to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. This is about angry white parents who, want, who don't want their children to be exposed to books or classroom discussions which confront racism in US history. They wanna dumb down education and get rid of anything that complicates it, it, this image of American exceptionalism. And this is absolutely dangerous because if this is the stuff, the prelude to fascist movements that we've read about in history. Thank you, Dr. Pat. And I'm gonna follow that briefly. You said, what's the connection? So the person who was postulating culturally relevant pedagogy in the 90s was also bringing critical race theory to education. So if you're interested, since, since this is a panel where we have teachers and educators participating, go look for Gloria Ladson Billings and William Tate's 1994 or 95, I think it's 95, 95 essay. So CR, CRP was 94, she did this in 95, she was busy in the 90s, I'm still busy. Go look for their article, their, their foundational article, bringing Derrick Bell into education toward a critical race theory of education. And in that time, in that almost 27 years, it's been built upon by a lot of different scholars, um, including some of us here. I just dropped it in the chat form, sis, 200%. Um, I think that she already, she made the connection. There, if you look uh, across the 50 states, when you start to see, um, whenever there are different iterations of standards, um, and ironically, I've been writing um, a bit now on standards and I have a chapter, a book chapter coming out in a book that Finn English put together called National Standards and the Structured Silence of White Supremacy. Um, because, we're talking about standards. And when you look back and you study the orientation of standards, you must remember that education, who it was for originally, right? Public education did not become a thing, right? So to Dr. Patton's point about elite uh, independent schools, everyone loves to talk about Horace Mann. Education is the great equalizer for whom? It he was not talking about everybody, y'all. He was talking about for white children. You know why? Because white wealthy planters paid people to come tutor their children at their, at their homes. Public education started to equalize or develop a baseline citizenry because um, to Dr. Patton's point, the founders didn't care about <laughs> all white people. They wasn't talking about all white people. They were talking about people like themselves. So it wasn't until there was a common school developed that even poor white children were able to get some sort of baseline education. 
And the, the, the standards were developed for them. Don't believe me? Check the date stamps on it. Okay. When we're taught, when, when they decided to, to develop uh, standards, uh, enslaved Africans, it was illegal for enslaved Africans to learn to read. We couldn't go to school. And so as we continue to go through iterations of standards that are supposed to improve education, part of the reason why it gets at Dr. Muhammad's question, why don't these standards ever address or speak to black kids? I'm gonna go in and throw in brown too. <laughs> because they weren't made for us. School was not made for us. We were not designed. We were not intended to be educated. I didn't want to, I retract the design. I meant the system wasn't designed for us. We were clearly designed for education because we created everything. The algebraic system, alphabet, everything, right? That said, CRT and CRE complement one another. And they can continue to complement one another when people are talking honestly about what CRT is. It is a prism, it's an analytical tool, it is a lens, it is a perspective, okay? That can, in fact, in education, with, um, Dr. Royale talks about Drs. Ladson Billings and um, Tate bringing CRT from the legal field into education, just like they use it in the law to examine inequities in the law. What we use it for here is to examine inequities in the schooling experiences, right? And we have found that it is based off of race. So why do we keep talking about race? Because y'all keep making it about race. Because it's always been about race, right? And so until we begin to go back and redress, not continue to triage, we keep putting band-aids on gaping wounds. And at this point, the system is hemorrhaging. So until we make those changes, there's going to be continuous and persistent iterations of reform because we don't want to go back and redress the actual issue, which is white supremacy. Thank you. Yes, sis. Oh, oh, you want to go to the next one? Okay. Um, you know, I, I don't think people, unless you're in it, I don't think people understand how racism pervades. Listen, I've had a down week because of racism and real, real estate and trying to have a house for my mom. I remember trying to have a uh, get a house for myself and they asked me for my superintendent's uh, email to confirm that I worked for a school district 10 years before. I said, I don't know where she at. <laughs> The racism is so real. It pervades every part of society. And if you are a Black woman, if you're a queer woman, if you're a Muslim, if you have other intersectional identities on top of it, man, we are tired. I'm tired this week of fighting. You know, I feel like this is an intellectual feast, what's happening. And, and that's what they call literary society member meetings. They call them intellectual feasts. You know, theory is something that just that has been studied over years that explains phenomena. You want to know why a child is happy or engaged in that curriculum, a theory will help with that. Do you want to know why a student is not responding to the curriculum, a theory will help with that. And, you know, when I when I saw the rhetoric around critical race theory, I thought to myself, huh, why didn't they ban feminism? If, if critical race theory, I mean, it's so, it's so complex, right? So I don't want to minimize the definition, but if it basically helps to explain why people in society are mistreated, marginalized, oppressed, hurt, violently, whatever, because of their race, and if feminism does that because of your gender, because you identify as a woman, why didn't they ban cognitive theory, social cultural theory? <laughs> I went through all my theories. Why didn't they ban critical theory? Critical theory says now, this helps to explain why people are mistreated, marginalized, oppressed, violently treated because of their ability, their age, their income. Now you got more categories. No, they wanted to focus on one group of people, black folks who experience racism, you can argue in this country to the detriment. Now, you know, I go back in history, my mother's a historian and history explains everything for me and when I find, I found this book years ago called The Measuring Rod of Textbook Selection, authored by Mildred Lewis Rutherford, one of the daughters of the Confederacy. She says, if 
the curriculum. She says, this is the guidebook for curriculum selection and textbook selection for US public schools, universities, and libraries. She says, if the book shows the person of color, I'm, I'm paraphrasing as genius, don't, don't, don't add that to our curriculum. Only show it, at, only show them as happy as slaves. Slavery was a good thing, she says. She says they were happy. She says, now I quote, reject a book, a textbook, a curriculum that shows the slaveholder of the South as cruel and unjust. They were loving and kind. See, they, they were basically, and they started with two groups of people. They started with women and girls. They wanted to indoctrinate because they said, you know, that's how we change the whole nation. And so this is just a reiteration of the measuring rod of textbook selection, because they don't see back then, they say, you're not gonna make my child feel bad for their father and grandfather. And today what's happening, you're not gonna make my child feel bad for me, for their father, for their grandfather, for their mother. Uh-uh, you won't make them look bad. So we have to, we never said, let's create a policy of how, you are inflicting harm to that black child for teaching Thomas Jefferson and all these people who hurt black people. Nobody said, let's do a policy, right? <laughs> Nobody thought about their harm. And first of all, no, no teacher I've met makes a, a child feel bad for something they didn't do. And if a child inflicted harm to their classmates, they should feel bad. That's a good social emotional trait. <laughs> you do something harmful, you feel bad for it. I think we're concerned about those children who keep, and adults who keep inflicting harm and feel nothing for us because Trayvon Martin was not theirs. Breonna Taylor was not theirs. See, they were ours. But when you don't, when you don't have the humanity and don't see them as your own children, as your own nephews and brothers and sisters, you don't have the humanity for this work. And you know that you're going to create some kind of policy. They know they're building off ignorance of people. People are not gonna understand critical race theory, so let's call it that. And we know that we can, we can tap into a power of ignorance and make them all indoctrinated like we did in the past. So this has been planned. And this is why we have to be uh, critical thinkers and conscious thinkers and keep doing this work forward. So that's what I'll add, you know, in addition to what the sisters has added already. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll move on to the next question. So originally, I just want to let you know, you all, I had I planned a break, a five minute break and between our session and our Q&A, but we are hot. We are hot and we're recording and we're going to continue. We have 20 minutes left. And so that might be enough time for one more question. Uh, and so I'll, I'll ask this question. Uh, many people assume that CRE is only relevant to English and history. How does CRE also apply to STEM courses? Well, I, I do a lot. I write curriculum every week. I love curriculum. That's that's the only, you know, art talent I got. <laughs> Maybe dancing a little bit. And but you know, so most of my culturally and historically responsive lesson plans are with STEM. Um, uh, you could take anything. If you are a scholar of your discipline, you should walk outside of math and see mathematics and see science. So uh, the teachers I work with, we are developing all sorts of topics, right? So uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, we should not just see ELA and social studies as humanities. It's a shift that I'm trying to push in, in my own work, mathematics is humanities, <laughs> Ma uh, science is humanities, PE is humanities. Everything we teach should be helping to improve and advance the human condition, okay? So when you think about the five pursuits I mentioned earlier, you can take anything, right? I took algebra two and we looked at uh, calculating um, uh, equations for reparations for Jewish, Japanese, and black people with students. Um, we recently in Chicago taught about uh, disorders of the bodies by teaching melanoma and students had to reflect for identity on their own healthcare practices. For intellect, they learned about um, the skin disease, what is melanoma? For criticality, they learned about the disparities that exist in healthcare. 
for uh, joy, you know, they learned about the beauty in their skin. That's a biology science class. And another quick example in teaching students how to calculate and find a percentage of a number, we did it in the context of video games. And identity, students learned about the identities and the representations of gamers in the gaming industry. They learned how there's an underrepresented uh, underrepresentation of people of color and women they calculated percentages. See, oh, we, we have countless of examples. And if anyone is really interested, I, I share all of those. You know, we have hundreds of examples. And so it's really about taking a, a topic. It doesn't have to be a culturally related topic. It could be a topic and connecting it to those five pursuits is what makes it that historically responsiveness. And it doesn't always have to be, I mean, I certainly work with math teachers who talk about drumming, hair braiding, and bring in the semiotics and the mathematics with it. But then they also look at roller coasters. You know, I taught a unit on roller coasters where we studied about the segregation and how amusement wasn't for everyone in the nation. We looked at the first roller coaster. We tapped into students' identities. Do you like to go to amusement parks? And we and I taught slope and proportional relationship. So it is possible to connect the world to STEM and make students understand what it means to be more human. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gordon. Please. Yeah, so I would add, I am not a math or science person at all, um, not, not in the slightest bit. I taught English when I taught um, seventh grade and high school. But here, here's what I would say. I have a dear friend at Morgan State University, Dr. Vanessa Dodo Siriki, um, who I worked with at Loyola University, Maryland, who is a scholar um, of science education, who writes about science education and culturally relevant teaching. So if you are a science teacher, um, if you are preparing science teachers, I highly recommend looking up Dr. Dodo Suriki's work um, and check out her references to see who she's in conversation with. I would add to that Erica Bullock at the University of Wisconsin, math education and culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, I would add Danny Martin out of, is he, is he there with you, um, Goldie? Yeah, he's at UIC. I thought so. University of Illinois, um, Chicago. All right, math, uh, math education and um, critical race theory, uh, Danny Martin. Um, there are so many scholars who are already doing this work. Thank you for adding um, Dr. Madkins out of UT Austin. She's STEM or science. Um, I don't know if she's STEM more broad, she's STEM. Uh, Tia Madkins, University of Texas at Austin. There's some dynamic, um, black scholars, there may be some other people, I don't know, but I know the black scholars who are already doing this work around culturally relevant teacher, um, science, math, and STEM. So it's not something that doesn't exist. It's not something that people haven't already been working toward um, for decades. It's out there. I think that you have to go find it, check it out, and connect it to what's happening in the classroom. Thank you so much. Did anyone else want to chime in or... I have one last question, or I, this may be the last question. And this is from the Q&A. Certainly, the role and commitment of individual teacher pedagogy to reflect the paradigm of cultural responsiveness is, without question, critically important. However, is it possible to realize CRE without making changes to policies, structures, and systems? What kind of policies and structures need to be put in place or removed in order to support realize CRE? And how important is it for classroom educators to think about the decisions being made outside of their classrooms? Can I start real quick, please? Pretty please. And no, I, I'm, I'm going to be, be short. Go ahead. I'm going to be short this time, I promise. My question to the person is what? is the intended outcome. Because if the intended outcome is for the district to say that we did this in lieu of, you know, George Floyd's murder, uh, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, we can even throw in Emmett Till. In lieu of the his history of unarmed Black people being murdered, um, Emmett Till wasn't murdered by the state. 
but his decision uh, <laughs> of not guilty, that verdict was sanctioned by the state. But if the goal is to actually make change, then you have to change policy. The reason why the system functions the way it functions is because of the policy. Policy is what undergirds and allows the system to continue to perpetuate the same flawed issues and keep getting the same product. So if you want there to be change, then yes, you would have to change the policy. But if you want to continue to sustain the system and you just want to say you did it, then I guess you don't have to change any policies. So let me add, um, I actually wrote something about how policy in Philadelphia, I think I sent it to you all, Liz, how policy in Philadelphia um, was trying to squelch teachers' um, use of culturally relevant pedagogies in schools. Okay, it's called They Schools. I, I think you have it, it's from Teachers College Record. Here's what I would say. I agree with everything Dr. Waite said, but I would add to that that we can't wait for policy. And so what there, have, what there has always been is a group of people who were subversive, who figured out how to maintain what they needed to maintain um, while people were watching, and then teach their students something uh, more liberatory, something toward their freedom, something toward their humanity and toward bigger lives, broader lives, um, to empower their own socio-political consciousness and interests beyond what's being observed and what's being measured. So I would argue that it has to be both and, and that as educators, we have to be willing to take on that risk and that you're gonna have to look at yourself to see um, how much risk can I handle? Right. How much what, what am I willing to put on the line for these students? Um, because sometimes it comes at great risk to us. Right. The thing that I think is important for us to remember is that we won't likely be asked to, to sacrifice anything greater than our ancestors were already asked to give up or prevented to achieve from the beginning. So the things that, that we have, the comforts that we've managed to amass. Right. If you're going to be for freedom, if you're going to be for liberation, if you're going to be for the people, in some ways you can't be tied to those things. And you can't be tied to the awards and the moving up and the pats on the back and the head nods to say that, you know, oh, you're, you're, you're one of us. Nah, if you're really about liberation, you're going to have to do some things that, that are going to rock the boat that may get you in a little bit of trouble. You're going to be dancing on that line and you may not know where the line is. You may not know where the line is until you cross the line. But that is literally what is required of us if we're working toward the full humanity um, and the liberatory practices for our young people. So I, I, I'm not being hyperbolic when I say you have to destroy the system and create something new. You got to rip up the floorboards and expose all the, the bugs and nasty stuff that, you know, at the roots because racism is you know, baked into our educational system. And we just keep slapping on new coats of paint, shellacking the floors, but the structure is, is, is poisoned, it's toxic. And now when I hear that question, I think about, you know, one of the biggest pitfalls of doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, a lot of people embrace this idea that you can just change people's minds. Um, but the most effective strategies focus on changing process, processes, changing policies, throwing things out, getting rid of people, moving people out of the way. It's not about changing minds. So, you know, you hear a lot about implicit bias, you know, non-conscious prejudices and stereotypes that are, you know, spontaneously and automatically activated that might inadvertently affect how people see and treat people of color. The hope is that, you know, if we do all these DEI trainings that, you know, people can learn to recognize and correct this damaging form of bias, which causes people to perpetuate bad systems and outcomes, sometimes unintentionally. Um, understanding implicit bias is a good thing, but it's too incomplete because it does not address racial justice or racial equity. These terms are, you know, these are the terms that people use kind of interchangeably, but they um, people conf they conflate them and don't understand the meaning of it. So what I'm saying here is that, you know, awareness of bias, 
right? Knowing that something is wrong doesn't necessarily change the outcome because that's not how people's brains work. Awareness alone doesn't prevent bias. Targeting unconscious bias through things like trainings is often ineffective because it relies too heavily on individual people's capacity to override their unconscious instincts and behaviors. And we overestimate our ability to change our own minds. And so for there to be lasting structural change that removes racial inequity and all that rot, um, and focuses on justice, you know, educational systems need to invest in changing processes and systems, not individual awareness and behaviors. So I believe if you're following the right processes, if you dig up the rot, tear up the floorboards, you throw things out, you'll reduce bias and increase diversity, whether you're aware of it or not. So that, that's my take, take on it. And, and yes, I think we are at a moment. So there's all these people leaving you know, the profession. Sometimes I'm like, no, that's exactly what they want you to do at precisely this moment when the K-12 system is predominantly black and brown. What better way to um, you know, intellectually disable a future um, uh, population that's going to be mostly black and brown than by taking away their educators. But then I see this as an opportunity to find opportunity in the chaos and to destroy it all and create something new. Absolutely. Dr. Mohammed, did you want to chime in? No, I'm good, sis. I think what was said was beautiful. It absolutely was. Uh, folks are calling for a part two. I'll be in, in contact with you all. Uh, I do want to uh, say thank you all so much for joining us. We have five minutes remaining and um, you know, uh, I can ask another question. We won't have time to answer it, um, but I will, I'm gonna ask it anyway. When a district or school commits to DEI or anti-racist work, what are the pitfalls, particularly in terms of the timeline and vision or resources, resources committed? And I know Dr. Waite, you spoke to this earlier, uh, but if anyone else wanted to chime in on the commitments to equity by a school. I'm a little <laughs> uh, skeptical, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it because y'all can't do anything. Um, so the district's first chief of equity is my dear friend, Dr. Sabria Jubilee. We shared an office at Temple University when we were doctoral students. Um, that's my homegirl. She came down to my house to help me rally so I could finish writing my book, just to give some context. When Sabria told me, Dr. Jubilee told me she was taking this job, one, I told her to stack her money, and two, I told her to shake the table, um, but also to know that she probably won't be in that position long. Okay, and that's not me wishing her any um, ill will. That's me wanting my friend to be prepared. Um, I had a hard time believing this district that I grew up in and that I studied as a researcher uh, was actually really willing to dismantle white supremacy, right? Um, but but all the things that sort of flow with that because the isms usually run together. So where we find white supremacy, we also find classism. We find gender oppression, right? Um, and so I know some people in Philly got good and mad at me about the um, op-ed I wrote about my dear Central High School and other special admission schools um, admitting more students from black and brown neighborhoods um, that are um, poorer than some other neighborhoods that don't usually get an opportunity to go to places um, like Central. Um, and I stand by what I wrote. Now, I understand there are some process things that you all need to do to repair that system. Um, but, but the system needed to be shifted and the system needs to change. And I look forward to seeing how the uh, special admissions policy for the school district of Philadelphia continues to change. Um, but I'm definitely concerned that with the, um, with the seat change, with Dr. Height leaving, um, and I reserve my opinions about that, but um, with Dr. Height leaving and a new superintendent coming in, what that will mean for the Office of uh, uh, Diversity and Equity and, and all these things um, in Philadelphia. And I wouldn't be surprised if those things get, get chucked. 
Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the school board doesn't hold um, the new superintendent to those things. And even more so, if they do try to hold the new superintendent to those things, I wouldn't be surprised if the changes are mere window dressings um, and not things that actually make a difference for the most vulnerable um, black and brown citizens of Philadelphia. Thank you, Dr. Royal. Uh, did anyone, anyone else want to chime in? We have less than a minute left. I'll just okay. say very quickly that oh, go ahead. I'm sorry that you need money, and you need to see how power flows in your system. Who has the power to affect change? Because I'm talking to a lot of DEI people and diversity hires, and you know they're in there, they're getting paid to do their work, but there's all these roadblocks um, in the way of them being able to effectively create system change. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Oh, I, I want to be mindful of time. So, uh, you know, I'm good. Well, I am. I'm very hopeful that uh, we will be able to continue this conversation at a later date. I do want to thank Dr. Sabria Jubilee, Tim McKenna, my principal here at Central, uh, Dr. Ted Domers, our assistant superintendent, Adam Northam and Michelle Gaynor for your help, uh, Ishmael Jimenez. Uh, Dr. Savoy Brooks, the Alumni Association at Central High School, and last but certainly not least, my team, Rachel Tolliver, Bianca Gillis, and Sophia Date for your help today. Uh, please do, do uh, remember to sign out um, using the sign out form that was dropped in the chat uh, to, to get your Act 48 credits. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Patton. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you, Dr. Waite. And thank you, Dr. Royal. This has been wonderful, and I will be in touch with you all. And thank you to our audience, our wonderful audience, uh, here and on Facebook and, and across America. Thank you for joining us and, and look out for more. Thank you.